Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio Podcast, the Geek Therapy Radio Podcast. I'm, of course, your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Did you enjoy the last episode of Geek Therapy Radio with my friend Dave, living in Japan, who is from New Zealand? I thought, I felt, that it was one of the best shows that I've done in a while. I enjoyed it thoroughly. That said, just because I think it's the best show or had uh, such a great time doing it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you enjoyed the show. Um, And it doesn't have to mean that. I'm perfectly fine with if I do shows that I don't feel great about that you really, really enjoy. Uh, And also vice versa, I am perfectly fine with doing shows that I love that you didn't particularly care for. It's it's all good. It all evens out in the end. As long as you like Geek Therapy Radio overall, that's all that uh, really matters as far as the audience is concerned. And I love having each and every one of you listen to Geek Therapy Radio. But let me know what you thought about the last episode. Let Let me know what you think about this episode, Geek Therapy, of course, the email plug, geektherapy at iheartmedia.com. Also, a great way to get in touch with me is just geektherapyradio.com. There's uh, contact information and everything there. Uh, just geektherapyradio.com. You can also find out information about how to support me on Patreon if you feel so uh, inclined to do so. There are some perks for uh, Patreon uh, members as of as I'm recording it right now. I need to hop over there and see what shoutouts <clears throat> I need to make. But what you get when you support me on Patreon is, uh, by and large, it's access to extended length interviews. So most of the time when I do interviews, like if I interview Clinton from Lazy Game Reviews or Dave, who is living in Japan, I have to whittle them down for broadcast. So broadcast means I only have 39 minutes total to work with. That's total. That's not even counting bump music. That's not even counting all the other kind of setup that I have to do in and out of segments. Uh, So the interviews have to be whittled down as much as possible to fit within the 39 minutes total runtime. But the interviews I do, we talk about all sorts of geeky things, usually for well over an hour. And it was no different with Dave, it was no different with Clint from Lazy Game Reviews. So if you support on Patreon, you'll have access to the full unedited. And what I mean by full unedited is, you'll hear the mistakes, you'll hear me saying check one, two, check one, two, and getting levels. It's it's really, really behind the scenes stuff. Unless the person I'm interviewing, you know, we get into something personal, there's personal details or anything about addresses or anything kind of like that. Uh, I'll, I'll cut that stuff out for, for safety's sake and for privacy's sake. But as far as the conversation goes, uh, it, it's all there. In the behind the scenes stuff, me setting levels for microphones if if necessary. It is the best, most raw look behind the scenes here at Geek Therapy Radio you can get. So that's available to all my uh, patrons on Patreon. Let's click over here because I have to do a couple of shout outs. That's one thing that I like about Patreon is it lets me know um, what I like, what I what I still need to do. So let's see here. I would like to give a shout out to Jonathan. Jonathan K, thank you so much. You've been a supporter for a uh, while now, supporter of Geek Therapy Radio. That is so thank you so much for your uh, patronage on Patreon, Uh, Jonathan. Thank you so much from the bottom of my geek heart. That means the world to me. Also, yes, Mike, Mike C, thank you so much for your donation as well. It still baffles my mind that people would uh, support me in such a way out of your own pocket like this. So I I really I never want it to be lost and I'm never going to ever take it for granted uh, that I have your patronage on and Patreon, even whether it's two dollars or five dollars, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're giving me, even if it's fifty cents, it, twenty five cents, I appreciate it all. And remember that at least ten percent of it goes to um, mental health research and mental health organizations. So, thank you so much for that. So, that's the shout outs. Thank you very much, Mike and Jonathan, for being the newest um, patrons over there on on Patreon. Last plugs before we move on to Xbox Series X news. Of course, is Geek Therapy Radio on Facebook, Geek Therapy Radio on Instagram, Geek Therapy Radio on uh, 
YouTube, Geek Therapy Radio. Wait, Geek Therapy Radio on Twitter. <laughs> That's so silly. Twitter's a really good place to get at me instantly. Get it? At me? Okay. I'm I'm stupid. But yeah, Twitter's a great way. Twitter, by and large, for the most part, is just a cesspool. I don't advise anyone to get on. I don't have a personal Twitter account. I couldn't dream of any world or reality where I would ever get a personal Twitter account. But for staying in touch with hosts and content creators and, and different kind of... I'm not a celebrity, but celebrities and things like that, it's, it's a good way to... Uh, to get some instant communication. They, they may not always uh, respond. I usually respond to everything that I get. Granted, I don't have you know, 300,000 followers or anything like that. That's not really what it's about. It's, it's just there and it's available to my listeners should they want to uh, get in touch with me more quickly um, if they have a Twitter account themselves. So just type in Geek Therapy Radio on Twitter. I think technically it's at Geek Therapy KPRC. There's a character limit on t- uh, Twitter. So, just type in Geek Therapy Radio on Twitter and it'll come up. Thank you so much. Share the podcast, too, with your friends if you like it. If you like uh, the show here, if you like Geek Therapy Radio, I'd appreciate you telling your friends and family about Geek Therapy Radio. Uh, if you think they'll if you think they'll like it, tell them to look out for the red and white and black color scheme. There's another, I don't try to bring this up too much, but there's another network called uh, GT Radio. That's not me. It's it's called like the Geek Therapy Network or something like that, and their colors are, are green, heavily around uh, green and black or something like that. That's not me. I carefully chose my color scheme because it's my favorite colors. Red and black color scheme is my favorite color. So if you type in Geek Therapy Radio and you're searching for Geek Therapy Radio, telling your friends about it, what to look for, look for some variation of, of red, black, or white, or the combination of all three. So... Those are the kind of nuts and bolts I can get to in the podcast when I'm not constrained um, by time and formats and broadcasts and all that kind of good stuff. Also, because when I have subjects that I'm going to get to, for instance, Xbox Series X, we're going to talk about here in more detail, uh, quite a bit of detail. Well, not too much detail. Everything you need to know. Um We'll have that discussion. I timestamp the stuff. So if I run on like I've been doing right now, going through some housekeeping and some behind the scenes stuff, it's at a seven and a half minutes or so now, if not longer with the bump, probably closer to eight minutes now. I put the timestamps always in the title or in the description so everyone knows if they want to skip all this preamble, know exactly when I get to the meat and potatoes. I could talk for an hour here about nothing and then get to the meat and potatoes. But it's always timestamped. I was watching, and I'm going to run on now because this is what we do on Geek Therapy Radio. I was watching the uh, the new Mark Maron um, Netflix stand-up comedy special. That was a long sentence. The other night, and I, I like Mark Maron. I love Mark Maron. I listen to his uh, podcast fairly regularly. And I don't like uh, critiquing or criticizing other people's podcasts because God knows... I do the same thing, and it, p- there's plenty for people to pick apart and critique about what I do. There's always something to criticize about other p- other people's artwork and everything like that. So I don't. I know that I'm open to it, so and I'm susceptible of it. I'm, I'm, I, I deserve it, for, to, you know, for one way or the other. But Mark Marin, as much as I love his his podcast, he'll go on for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, just talking about whatever. You know, he'll put in the title, the guest on the show that day, but it will be 30 or 40 minutes before you get to the guest and you don't know exactly when he gets to the guest. So when listening to his stuff, it just gave me the idea, man, I I wish there were podcasts that when they have the meat and potato subject or they have a guest on, that somewhere clearly visible, they have the exact timestamp of when they get to the meat and potatoes, or the guest, or maybe their guest is a sack of meat and potatoes. I don't care. So it's kind of a convenience, convenience to you, the listener, that I do put the timestamps for the specific topic that I put in the titles. Not enough podcasts, I think, do that. And I, and I understand why they do that. They want you to listen through all the preamble. They want you to hear about all the plugs that they're doing. They want to hear all the ads and everything like that. And there is fast-forward function on podcasts, and you can double the playback speed to 2x or whatever. You can keep hitting the fast-forward 30 seconds little thing there. But I just try to put the time right there. It's going to say Xbox Series X, parentheses, at 
the timestamp that I started talking about. There's people that have a lot to do. They listen to a lot of podcasts. They have a lot to get through. So if they don't want to listen to me just ramble on now for 10 or 11 minutes, they can just go boop, bring the slider right to where I'm talking about Xbox Series X, which in this particular podcast is right now. Let's talk about the Microsoft Xbox Series X. Part of this is really going to suck because I'm going to talk about the other models of Me- uh, Xbox. <laughs> Mexbox <laughs> just made me think of something so funny. <laughs> oh gosh, I don't want to get derailed with what a Mexbox could possibly be. Oh lordy. Okay, but it's going to get kind of sucky because I'm going to say Xbox Series X, Xbox One X, Xbox One S, and all the combinations thereof. And it's it, it, please bear with me as we wade through this water of terrible Microsoft Xbox nomenclature. So I think we're going to start out with the specs of the Xbox Series X and we'll let the conversation naturally evolve from there. And by conversation, I mean, I'm going to tell you stuff and you can either email me or tweet at me or whatever what you think about what I said, which is perfectly fine and I love you for it. So let's start with the actual specs of the Xbox Series X. Okay, CPU is the 8-core Zen 2 AMD processor that can cruise all day long at up to 3.8 gigahertz. And by up to, I mean if it needs to run 24 hours a day at 3.8 gigahertz for whatever reason, you just never shut it off and you're at a very particularly scenery intense part of a game, it can cruise along at 3.8 gigahertz, uh, 3.6 gigahertz with SMT. The GPU is a 12 ter- is 12 teraflops, 52 compute units at 1825 megahertz or 1.825 gigahertz and it's the new custom AMD RDNA 2 chipset there there's no okay we'll get into kind of how much more powerful that is than previous generations of Xbox but right now again we're just going through the uh, the specs here the die size well I'm not going to go over die size okay die size 360.45 millimeter squared processes the TSMC 7 nanometers enhanced Process for so that's AMD seven nanometers enhanced architecture. Memory is sixteen gigabytes of GDDR six. Sixteen gigabytes of GDDR six. Wonderful. Uh, the memory bandwidth it says 10, 10 gigabytes. Oh, okay. This is what it means. So it's split. There's sixteen gigabytes of GDDR six, but it's split. So 10 gigabytes of it, the memory memory bandwidth is 560 gigabytes per second. Six gigabytes of it is at just 336 gigabytes per second. So even at its slowest, it's blazing fast memory. Although that said, the Xbox One X, uh, its GDDR5 ran at 326 gigabytes per second. So the Series X is at 336 gigabits per sec- gigabytes per second at its slowest. So there's not much difference there as far as the, the quote unquote slow memory is concerned. But 10 gigabytes of the 16 gigabytes is at a quite a bit faster 560 gigabytes per second. That's huge. And we'll get on to all this stuff, why all these facts and figures are huge uh, momentarily. Internal storage. Possibly one of one of the most imp- uh, important aspects of what makes the Xbox Series X so powerful is its one terabyte of custom NVMe SSD storage. It's about uh, 2.4 gigabytes per second. Of I- I'm gonna assume it doesn't say. I'm gonna assume that's read speed. That may be read and write. I don't know. I don't have all the information in front of me. But the throughput on the NVMe SSD is 2.4 gigabytes per second. I w- I'm just going to assume that's 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 read. It could be read and write, but I don't have the information in front of me. If you do have that information in front of you as far as the actual read and write speeds, 
again, we're just assuming that it's 2.4 gigabytes per second of, of read speed, which is the important thing. Don't get me wrong. That's the important thing with a gaming console like this, is how fast it reads from the flash memory to feed the RAM, to feed uh, the system on chip, to feed the CPU, to feed the graphics and everything like that. So that 2.4 gigabytes per second, it's definitely read speed at least. I'm just wondering if the write speed is equivalent or probably a little, a little lower. Typically in NVMe drives or any sort of solid state drive, typically the write speed is at least a little bit lower than the read speed. Either way, 2.4 gigabytes per second in a console of NVMe, custom NVMe memory, one terabyte of it, that is mega. That is mega, mega, mega. It has expandable storage that kind of looks like memory cards, and this is crazy. We'll, we'll talk about this for a second. They look like memory cards from PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. You remember what those look like? Those just, I don't know, a couple of square inches or so. But instead of holding, you know, four megabytes of save data, 16 megabytes if you were a baller, 32 megabytes if you were just the rich kid in your neighborhood, these new expansion... Uh, cards are the, roughly the same size. They look very similar. It's one terabyte. It's not just for game saves and things. It's for expanding storage. Yes, you will still be able to expand storage also over USB. In this case, it's USB 3.2. If you have Xbox 360 games or Xbox One games already on an external solid state drive, two and a half inch solid state drive, uh, or three and a half inch external hard drive, two and a half inch external hard drive, whatever you have your game saved on from previous generations of Xbox, you can still plug it into the Xbox Series X over USB 3.2 and your whole library is just there. Don't gloss over that fact, what I just mentioned. That is huge, that you don't have to re-download your entire library of games if you already have a substantial library on Xbox One S, on Xbox uh, One X, it's, it's getting confusing again, but you have all these, it's backwards compatible, and you don't need to re-download everything to that one terabyte of, inter, of internal memory. If you have a hard drive, a traditional, you know, optical hard drive that you had for a few years, and you just accumulated, you know, a terabyte or two terabytes of a game library and other whatnots, videos and movies and all sorts of things, just plug that into the Xbox Series X. It will all work. And we'll get into this a little bit more later. Let's say you have an Xbox uh, One S game. There are so many awesome features of the Xbox Series X that in a, a lot of games, if not all of them, you can add HDR. It's kind of like synthetic HDR. I probably would never use this personally because I don't like synthetic anything. It's kind of like when I use cassette tapes. I don't like using this. Is that was way off the wall? But I don't like using noise reduction on on cassette tapes. I don't like synthetic kind of whatever, but you do have the choice. If you have an Xbox One S game that you're playing on an Xbox Series X, you can enable a high, dyna high dynamic range. So it kind of breathes a new life to old Xbox games. There's all sorts of other features and enhancements that can the Xbox Series X can bring to old, older Xbox games. Okay, moving on. Optical drive, 4K UHD Blu-ray drive. That hasn't changed since the Xbox One S. It's still the same 4K Blu-ray drive. Here's where things start to get interesting here. It's the performance target. So the perform let's go back to the Xbox One S. The performance target of the Xbox One S was 1080p at 30 frames per second up to 60 frames per second and I know a lot of us PC master race gamers out there are just barfing 1080p at 30 that was a huge argument as to the superiority of PC gaming over console gaming it's that consoles were always a bit behind PC at best consoles would be as good at PCs but then since they could, they weren't modular and you couldn't upgrade them they would fall behind within six months they'd be obsolete graphically and, and hardware wise to PCs because you could just upgrade components. Oh, graphics got better? Upgrade create a better graphics card on my PC. Oh, storage got better? Upgrade storage. Oh, I need more RAM for this game? Just get more RAM. Consoles couldn't do that. So the Xbox One, A, One S target performance was 1080p at 30 frames per second up to 60 frames per second. You were lucky if you were to play a game at 1080p 60 frames per second on an Xbox One S. Moving up to the Xbox One X, I hate these names. The Xbox One X performance target was 4K at 30 frames per second up to 60 frames per second. And you'd be lucky 
on an Xbox One X to get 4K at 60 frames per second. There was different methods to this. They could upsample and whatever to, to try to achieve 4K, up, up, upscale 1080p games to 4K and vice versa and try to get bump it up to 4K at 60 frames per second. That was quite lofty for the Xbox One X. But moving on to the Xbox Series X, the t- performance target is 4K at 60 frames per second up to 120 frames per second. So performance target for the Xbox Series X, 4K at 60 FPS, up to 4K at 120 FPS. So the bare minimum starting point, that's the key takeaway here on the Xbox Series X, and it's kind of important. It's critical here. Especially, you got to remember, we're talking about console gaming. The target, the minimum target is 4K, true 4K, at 60 frames per second. Let that sink in a little bit there. This We're talking about a console. Right now, in the year 2020, a few months before the Xbox Series X is set to launch, it's going to, uh, we expect it to launch at the near the end or the last quarter of uh, 2020, I would imagine before the, the holiday season. At best right now, gaming PCs are mether, are we, are measured by whether or not they can game at a smooth 4K 60 frames per second. The most powerful gaming PCs right now are ranked by how well they can run 4K at 60 frames per second and it's a challenge to do that. The minimum card you need right now, well it depends on the it depends on the game and graphic settings, but but popularly right now the best, the minimum card for 4K for a smooth 4K 60 frames per second of AAA titles is the GTX 1080, not as, not the RTX 2080. That'll do it as well. It'll do it better, obviously. But the minimum card right now, all things considered, for smooth AAA title flagship games, 4K 60 frames per second, is the GTX 1080. The GTX 1080, you will be lucky to find for less than $400. As of recording, I've been going around Amazon, looking around. I've seen them. Uh, I saw one on Amazon for $375. Perhaps you can find one cheaper on eBay if you want to risk dealing with an eBay seller. But we can all agree right now, 2020, as of recording, to play 4K games at a smooth 60 frames per second, it's popularly agreed that the GTX 1080 is the card to get, and it is around $400 even used. That brings me to this point of price. I haven't mentioned price. And if you disagree, real quick, if you disagree with that statement, if you can think of a better graphics card that's cheaper, this is the type of debate that can go on between PC gamers forever. These are the type of threads that you see on Reddit, the type of threads that you see in various PC gaming forums around the internet that just go forever. Quote, what is the best graphics cards for 4K gaming? Because there's so many variables. For instance, you could play Rocket League at 4K 60 frames per second by adjusting the settings down or up to taste. If you had a, uh, I, I could do it on a, with a GTX 1060. You could probably do it with a G. I can definitely do it with a GTX 980 if I pick and choose what kind of graphic settings that I that I want. Because an esports title like Rocket League isn't that difficult to play. It's something else entirely when you're talking about Doom Eternal. I wanted to fit that plug in there. Doom Eternal has come out. If you want to play Doom Eternal <clears throat> 4K 60 frames per second, it's it's just probably not happening, especially with all the settings cranked up. It's not happening on anything less than a GTX 1080 or a, a RX, what, what's the 590-ish? I don't, don't quote me directly on what the AMD equivalent would be. Uh, but you need a beefy graphics card, and it's going, the point I'm getting across here is you need a graphics card, I think we can all agree on this, that's going to cost a few hundred dollars for smooth 4K, 60 frames per second of AAA titles think Doom Eternal, 4K 60 frames per second, you're going to have to spend at least a few hundred dollars on a graphics card. Arguably between at least, man, I'm going to go, I'm going to lowball $250 to $400. That is absolute lowball. An average is probably more around $350, $400 or so to play 4K 60 frames per second in a modern flagship title. 
300 to 400 dollars or so we don't know that's all that to say this i'm sorry i clear my throat i don't have coronavirus um <clears throat> that i know of we don't know the price specifically yet of the xbox series x but most popular speculation and most agreement is had around the ballpark of five hundred dollars sony says or not sorry i'm sorry uh, microsoft it's costing them um about 450 between 450 500 dollars on their end to produce the xbox series x to build it on their end um some speculate that 600 dollars for the consumer price isn't out of the question most people tend to lean towards five hundred dollars five hundred dollars is a is a nice middle number six hundred dollars you're you're edging closer you're leaning more towards a thousand dollars it becomes way more of a boutique thing when you get six hundred dollars playstation 3 was six hundred dollars when it came out yes um playstation 4 was what was playstation 4 uh five hundred dollars let me double check i'm sorry it was four hundred dollars but things it's different now there you have inflation you have inarguably uh much better hardware going into the xbox series x and and assumably the the playstation 5 whenever it comes out uh so i doubt nobody playstation sony and microsoft would be taking a significant loss if they launched the ps5 and xbox series x at 400 dollars uh, like the ps4 launched at especially when both companies are saying they can't build them for much less than 500 dollars on their end but when sales are concerned and making up the money on the other end through software sales and other different aspects of making money I think we can mostly agree. You can you're free to disagree of course, but I think we can mostly agree that the Xbox Series X if it comes out for more than $500, we would be genuinely surprised. If it came out for less than $500, we would be delightfully surprised. But $500 for the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. But let's stick with the Xbox Series X. $500 is most likely. If I was going to bet in Vegas, $500 would be the mark. Go back to that GTX 1080 for 4K. Remember, the Xbox Series X, the target is 4K 60 frames per second. That's the minimum target for their games is 4K 60 frames per second. And we think it's going to cost $500. To get just the graphics card, let's say you wanted to build an equivalent PC, a gaming PC, that the minimum, the spec was 4K 60 frames per second, you would arguably need that GTX 1080 for around 300 to 400 dollars right there how much more of that pc are you going to build to keep it at the price of an xbox series x to keep it around 500 dollars you're talking about a motherboard maybe you can get away with 50 bucks on the motherboard then you're talking about storage then you're talking about ram there's so much more it is almost impossible if not impossible impossible to build a gaming PC that can game at 4K, 60 frames per second, AAA titles for less than $500. So, forgive the pun here, but the Xbox Series X, if it's to launch at $500, which everyone speculates it will, and its target is 4K, 60 frames per second, that's 4K, 60 frames per second gaming for $500. Yes, I know I'm discounting the cost of games itself, $60, but it's the same. that's the same factor on the PC side as well. When people build PCs and they give, give a budget for building the PCs, they're not counting things like uh, software titles and your Steam account and things like that. It's just we're talking hardware here. So hardware, 4K gaming, 60 frames per second, Xbox Series X, $500. To build the equivalent PC that can game at 4K, 60 frames per second in AAA titles, it's going to be way, way more than $500, especially considering what I've talked about previously on Geek Therapy Radio is that coronavirus, COVID-19, is going to affect the supply chains of chip manufacturers, of hardware component manufacturers, all of that. So the price of RAM is going to go up. The price of solid state memory is going to go up. The price of everything is going to go up. How much it's going to go up, that's to be seen, but it is going to go up increased demand on solid state storage i've talked about in the past so everything all the price of everything building a pc in 2020 is going to amount it's not going to be as good as it was in 2019 we might be going into a kind of a pc building recession here so if 
the Xbox Series X comes out $500, 4K gaming, 60 frames per second. That means at least for a brief moment in time, at, at least for just a brief moment, consoles will be, oh, this is going to draw some heat if I say this, just as powerful, if not better than gaming PCs, at the definitely at the $500 budget point. That's just the truth, right? At least for a brief shining moment in time, it would be impossible to game at 4K 60 frames per second in AAA titles for less than the cost of an Xbox Series X. Of course, the same thing will happen as happened in previous generations of consoles. They'll in, Nvidia will come out with a new GPU. Uh, the the RAM standard might change again. Who knows what's going to change? AMD might come out with better graphics cards. I mean, undoubtedly they will in the life cycle of the Xbox Series X. But for a few months, several months, you will not be able to game at 4K 60 frames per second uh, at a better price point than the Xbox Series X for around $500. Even if it's $600, it's this going to be the same story. Very, very interesting. Uh, so I want to talk about some other improvements that's you know happening with the Xbox Series X. Latency. So input lag is uh, a critical point here. They basically lifted as many bottlenecks as possible. And they're saying that for the new Xbox Series X controller, which by the way, the Series X controller uh, is minimally, minimally different from uh, the old Xbox controllers. Uh, Xbox uh, One S controller. I have a couple of those laying around. Um, matter of fact, the Xbox Series X controller will be backwards compatible with Xbox uh, One S, Xbox One X, and everything like that, and vice versa. You can play Xbox One S. You can use the Xbox One S controller on the Xbox Series X. So that's cool that the controllers are so. Is ambidextrous the right word? Ambiguous. They can, they're backwards compatible and forwards compatible. So no matter if you have a modern Xbox controller, you can use it with the Xbox Series X and vice versa. Series X controllers working on older hardware as well. But the great thing here, the improvement here, without getting into too much technical detail, is that the new Xbox Series X controller use what Microsoft is calling dynamic latency input. And basically what it all boils down to is that you'll have a few extra milliseconds of response time. Basically, in a nutshell, it's it's the way the system communicates with the controller, and it's going to allow uh, game developers to take that into account when uh, making their games, especially for, for Twitch shooters like Doom I just mentioned, and esports and fighting games. You're going to have a few extra milliseconds of reduced latency. This goes back to the the uh, performance um, targets. It says 4K 60 frames per second up to 120 frames per second. So if you're playing a game and your TV supports this at 120 hertz, the input lag on the controller starts to really matter then, and the input lag is going to be uh, more than adequate. Isn't even the right word. It's going to be more than sufficient for playing at 120 hertz. The fact is, most gamers would will just won't notice that improve that improvement in input latency, but it will be there. And and expert players of fighting games and Twitch based um, shooters will definitely appreciate uh, the benefit, the decreased latency when playing at say 60 uh, hertz or even up to 120 hertz. So. That if you're using the Xbox Series X controller now that I've said that, if you're using the Xbox Series X controller on the Xbox One X or Xbox One S, obviously it's not going to have the same type of latency improvement. It's probably it's going to default back to Xbox uh, One and Xbox One X's uh, default protocol as far as controller and joystick input is concerned. Um, there was I was reading here that for the Xbox uh, One Xbox One controllers, Xbox One S controllers. Um, it was sampling inputs from the controller. The system was sampling inputs from the controller every eight milliseconds. It was just basically checking with the controller every eight milliseconds. Where's the thumbstick at? Where are our buttons at? Checking every eight milliseconds. So now, rather than having that kind of steady every eight milliseconds, you know, querying the controller, see where it's at, the system is just going to basically, in, in, in what Xbox and what Microsoft is calling, quote, just in time 
type of latency that happens each frame or pre-frame. I don't know. Please don't. I am not an engineer. I'm not a developer. I don't know exactly, precisely how it works, other than Microsoft says that it will improve latency by a few milliseconds. And Microsoft is calling it dynamic, uh, dynamic latency input system. Input lag is going to be reduced, especially if you're lucky enough and a game is compatible with playing at 120 hertz. Okay, so one of the last points I wanted to make here, and there's there's a lot. I'm going over the big the big hit points here uh, for you here in the podcast. Otherwise, I'm going to be talking for. Uh, I mean, I'm probably going to approach an hour for this podcast, anyways. But there's so much improvement, so much technology happening in the background. Ray tracing. I haven't even touched on ray tracing. The GPU in the Xbox Series X is going to have uh, ray tracing at the uh, hardware level. So. I was watching, a, um, what is it? I, it was, um, I've had him on the show before, Austin Evans, doing a demonstration of a tech demo uh, of Minecraft where he could turn ray tracing on and off. And I'm sure a lot of you listening have probably already seen that video. It hits 2.2 million views in like the last less than 24 hours or so. It's crazy. Um, but ray tracing built into uh, the system at the hardware level. It's not synthesized ray tracing, it's actual ray tracing. And it looks really really cool so speaking of graphics one of the things that's going to be make the series x a game changer as far as consoles are concerned pun intended is that speed of the memory not only the speed of the memory improvements remember it was 560 10 10 gigabytes of the system gdr6 memory was going to operate at 560 uh, gigabytes per second and let me scroll back up yeah 560 gigabytes per second the I.O. The, the I.O. of the system is uh, where where did I look at that? Yeah, the overall I.O. of the system is 2.4 gigabytes per second. On the Xbox One X, it was 120 megabytes per second. Going back further, even on the One S, it was 120 megabytes per second. So One S I.O. throughput was 120 megabytes per second. Xbox One X, same. I.O. throughput 120 megabytes per second. On the Xbox Series X, I.O. throughput 2.4 gigabytes per second, 4.8 gigabytes per second compressed. That type of, let's call it instant access between the RAM, both the system RAM and the video RAM, and the NVMe solid state drive, that type of instant throughput and massive bandwidth of, of memory being switched back and forth through all the different components is going to absolutely just unleash the power that developers have at their disposal. Here, and, and one of the most critical ways is is obviously going to be level loading times. So, one of the tricks they used to use back in the day, which wasn't too long ago, but Let's think about Portal. Most of us have played Portal or any game where they kind of there's like this in between between the two levels um, where you're in this small kind of confined space uh, for a few seconds or maybe a minute or maybe less than 30 seconds, 35 seconds or so. So in the game Portal, every time you finished a level in Portal, you walk into the elevator and you're in this tiny little cylindrical elevator. It's extremely simple for the graphics card and the system to to draw that uh, to render that elevator while you're moving and it simulates the moving you're walk, kind of rocking back and forth the lights are kind of moving on the wall or whatever but really what was happening in the background outside of that elevator so to speak was the system was trading memory around is taking memory off of your hard, hard disk loading it into RAM and doing everything and doing everything with the video memory so that elevator was basically to hide what's going on in the background of the new level loading Developers don't have to rely on the quote-unquote elevator trick anymore. Access to all the, the memory, both the storage and the RAM, is so fast now, so instantaneous now, that the action from level to level, it's, it can all be a continuous experience. So if you're playing you know, the new Gears of War or, or whatever game you're playing, there is no more kind of elevator. It's not going to rely so much at all on the the, the elevator, quote unquote, technique. It's just the world is going to unfurl before you. This makes me think also of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. This is probably a similar, uh, uh, 
we all know that Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is also coming to the uh, Xbox Series X. You don't have to, when you're looking out toward the horizon and you're seeing things kind of render, you know, the, the draw distance. Remember the draw distance on uh, PlayStation 1 or even PlayStation 2? How it would basically simulate fog on the edges because it, the, the system could not draw the level out that far to the horizon. That's not an issue with the Xbox Series X now. The whole thing is just going to be there. Everything up to the horizon that your eye can see that the pixels can depict is going to be drawn virtually in real time there's going to be no kind of waiting and watching things pop into existence as in the past because the memory in the throughput in the io is so monstrously more powerful and so monstrously faster than previous generations of xbox consoles remember we were talking about 120 megabytes per second on the previous generations now we've jumped to 2.4 gigabytes how many multitudes how many how much exponentially faster is that than previous generations? It was something like 40 times or something like that. It's it's massive. It is a massive leap. So the Xbox Series X is going to be the most powerful console. We're still going to see what uh, PlayStation 5 has up their sleeve. I imagine it's going to be tit for tat, toe to toe going here. But consoles have gotten so incredibly powerful that right now it's hard to imagine building a, sim- a, a PC that's similarly capable at the same price point. The same price point. That's what's so huge about this. Is there anything else to, to, to bring up? I, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about here with the Xbox Series X, but those are the big hitters. Those are the big, absolute biggest things you need to know Uh, i could talk about the hardware the cooling situation um it looks like there's a main motherboard and a a, a daughter board on the side main board and daughter board is that something a term that people even still use anymore to describe pc hardware components it's basically cracking the motherboard in half and putting it in a different part of the system um Roughly, daughter boards can be anything. Daughter boards can be modems. Daughter daughter boards could have been video cards. Daughter boards could be anything. But it's, you've seen we've seen the form factor of the Xbox Series X. That's is how it's going to look out in the wild. Um, so to fit all that in there, it's kind of like a square. To me, it reminds me of a square uh, trash can Mac. Remember the Mac Pro 2013? I think Mac Pro they called it the trash can because it looked like a little tiny bathroom trash can. Uh, the Xbox Series X reminds me of that, except it's uh, obviously brick-shaped. It's rectangular, but it looks really cool. I'll include a link down to the R's article, obviously, in the podcast, as I am one to do. I always link the uh, um, pertinent information, pertinent articles in these podcasts, so you can have a look through it yourself. So I guess the final question here, to, to wrap this up, The elephant in the room is, would I spend, I mean, we'll start with me and then I'll pose the question to you, but would I spend $500 on an Xbox Series X? For, For me, it all boils down to this. Yes, I want an Xbox Series X. I would love to have an Xbox Series X. It's basically just gonna boil down to, could I afford just just to throw $500 at a new console? And I think that's what it's going to boil down to for a lot of gamers out there. So I pose the question to you. If you had $500 just to throw around, or if you're going to save up $500, are you interested in the Xbox Series X? Me personally, I am very interested in the Xbox Series X. Will I actually buy one? I don't know. I I don't know. For a lot of us, I have to mention this, we're still waiting to see what the PS5 can do and the price point of the PlayStation 5. There's no word that I'm aware of now of yet of when PS5 is going to do its official release to the public of specs and 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 let, you know, content creators and reviewers have access to the PlayStation 5 the way Xbox Series X has recently done or the way X Microsoft has re- recently done with the Xbox Series X. I told you it was going to get muddy with all these names. So I think that's a safe point is 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 we're going to wait and see. Do we want Xbox Series X or do we want PlayStation 5? We have to wait for 
PlayStation 5 now to drop the ball. We have to wait for Sony to drop the ball on the PlayStation 5. But thus far, from what we've seen of the Xbox Series X, it is a monster. Let's not discount what I've mentioned a few times here. 4K, 60 frames a second, up to 120 frames per second, AAA titles for what's probably going to be $500, maximum $600, and it will be impossible, virtually impossible, to build a new PC from scratch to meet those specs. Very interesting. Microsoft has, has cranked up the knob here when it comes to console gaming, but also PC gaming. It's going to be interesting now. A reminder, a lot of games are compatible. On Xbox, a lot of games are compatible with mouse and keyboard. The Microsoft system, after all. There, there were games for the PlayStation 2, even. Sony, PlayStation 2, that were mouse and keyboard compatible. Resident Evil 4, I believe, is the first thing that comes to my mind. PlayStation 4, or sorry, PlayStation 2, Resident Evil 4 could be played with a mouse and keyboard. Gaming's going to get interesting. The landscaping for gaming is going to get interesting. Now it's going to be a pe people who have relatively powerful PCs saying that they can't play at the same resolution and frame rate as a $500 or possibly $600 console. That's cool. I, overall, I think the end the end result is that we all win in this. It's not there's no one going to be a loser in this scenario. It's just that gaming has become so great and so accessible that somebody who only has five dollars to spend on a new gaming rig can now seriously look at an Xbox Series X and be just as visually pleased as a PC Master Race gamer is. Very cool. What a time to be alive. Thank you for listening to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast. I hope you are using this time of self-quarantine and social distancing to, to rekindle. Now is the best excuse ever. Please don't come out on the other side of this uh, quarantine situation and this coronavirus situation, whether you agree with how we're reacting to it or not. Don't come out on the other side of this with all this extra free time now, uh, depending on who you are. I know there's a lot of kids home from school, but the point is we can't we're, we can't go out to concerts much anymore, movies, restaurants. There's We're kind of restricted in our social gatherings and the size of social gatherings. There is going no matter how do you, no matter how you slice it. There's going to be more time now that we can devote to rekindling our hobbies, learning new hobbies, rekindling old geek things. So don't come out of the other side of the coronavirus without having added to your skill set, so to speak. Well, that without having reinvigorated a fire or a passion for your own geek thing. Use this as an opportunity to reinvest in you. That's a really good way to put it. Use this opportunity, if you can, to reinvest in you. I know a lot of people, waiters and, and bartenders, aren't going to be working right now, so they're not going to be... Money's going to be tight. And what do you do when money's tight? You don't spend the money. You reinvest that time and effort, hopefully, into yourself. So let's use that time to reinvest that time, effort, and energy that we would be working, or if we need to save money, kind of... Rethink how we're going to entertain ourselves. I think a lot of people are going to get tired of social media through this. I think they're going to be home and they're going to, I don't know, it's going to be interesting to see how we come out of the other side of this. Ultimately, I know we're going to be just fine. We will definitely be just fine on the other end of this. Don't give in to all the doom and gloom. We're going to be okay. Anyways, like I said, thank you for listening to Geek Therapy Radio Podcast. Know that you are worthy of love both giving and receiving love know that you are worthy of your own self-respect thank you thank you thank you to all my patrons out there thank you so much for sharing Geek therapy radio with your friends i love you all for it i can't wait to talk to you in the next one have a great day everybody hey.